Hello everybody and welcome to our second video in our series of videos on the Age of Exploration. Last time we looked at the Indian Ocean Trading Network uh, and we talked about some of the great powers such as the cities of Mogadishu and Mombasa on the eastern coast of Africa, uh, Arabia and the city of Mecca, we talked about India, we talked about Southeast Asia and we talked about China. We also talked about some of the things that were traded on this uh, network of this trading network, such as spices, cloths, books, gold, ivory, coffee. So this time we are going to be looking at the Great Silk Road, which really it wasn't just one road; it was more like a, a system of roads. Um, we're going to be looking at two famous travelers who documented their travels. Uh, before uh, the Age of Exploration takes place and we are also going to look at some technological advancements that will be crucial uh, in helping the Europeans launch into the Age of Exploration. So as always our learning outcomes from this video what I want you guys to take away from this video is first of all I want you guys to be able to know what the Silk Road is, uh, second I want you guys to know about the two famous travellers we will be talking about and at least one piece of information about them. And third, I want you guys to know uh, three technical advances brought from China and the Middle East to European navigation and shipbuilding, which will become crucial uh, to uh, Europe really becoming a dominant power in the world. So uh, the Great Silk Road was uh, an overland trading network. Um, as you can see, um, it is outlined here with the orange lines. Uh, this route was established around 700 CE. Um, the Great Silk Road would be more, it would be more accurate to call it the Great Silk Roads uh, because there are many different routes as you can see here from the, from the orange maps. Um, it wasn't as reliable or profitable as the Indian Ocean Trade Network which I can see here um, mainly because uh, the merchants overland were more prone to attacks or uh, a higher tax could be put on them if a new ruler uh, took over an area. Uh, also, we didn't have any cars, there's no cars or lorries back then, so everything had to be transported uh, on camels. Um, so they couldn't really transport things in the large quantities that they could on ships uh, in the Indian Ocean Trade Network. So um, the merchants and traders would usually travel along the Great Silk Road in groups known as caravans to protect themselves from being robbed or from bandits. Um, however, despite the disadvantages of the Great Silk Road, uh, it was an invaluable source uh, in importing spices into Europe, which had become a commodity or a thing that Europeans didn't want to live without um, because they really helped to disguise the smell of rotten meat that they had to eat because uh, there was no refrigeration at the time. Uh, so one of the European travellers who famously travelled the Great Silk Road uh, was a man called Marco Polo. He was born in the city of Venice in 1254. Um, uh, his father was a merchant uh, and he became a merchant as he grew up. So uh, he left Venice at the age of 17 in 1272 uh, to travel along the Great Silk Road. Um, he spent three and a half years traveling along the Great Silk Road. Uh, he would have stopped in places like Baghdad, uh, Olmuz, Gashgar. Um, and would have taken in a lot of the cultures that were going on there. It was a really vibrant place uh, at the time. Um, so he spent three and a half years traveling around this route that's highlighted in red. Uh, after that, he spent the next 16 years working in China uh, for the emperor uh, of the time, who was Kublai Khan. Uh, he was actually a grandson of Genghis Khan, who you may have heard of. Uh, and Kublai Khan had conquered China in 1271 and had become emperor. Uh, upon returning home, uh, Marco Polo got involved in a war between Venice and the Republic of Genoa, uh, and he was arrested and imprisoned. 
Um, so while in prison, he retold his stories to uh, and the wonders he'd seen to to the other prisoners. Um, and one of the one of the prisoners wrote it down, uh, and the book, The Travels of Marco Polo, became a big hit. Um, so this book piqued the interest of those in Europe who read about the amazing palaces and riches uh, and empires. Uh, they would have heard about uh, the Forbidden City that was been built in Beijing at the time. And it really would have inspired a lot of travelers and explorers to go further on um, and, and to see more of the world beyond Europe. Um, so on his trips, Marco Polo would have encountered some of the amazing navigational innovations that China had, like the magnetic compass. Um, so the magnetic compass was a reliable way of knowing which direction you were going in. Um, he also would have come across these things known as Latin sails, uh, which would uh, become very important in improving European ships. So Latin sails were these triangular sails, and they were used to sail uh, against the wind. So if the wind wasn't blowing the way you wanted, you could still sail in the direction you wanted. Uh, they would usually be uh, at the back of the ship, as you can see in this picture in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, uh, Europe at the time mainly used square sails. So these triangular sails are going to become very important. So that's Marco Polo. The second um, explorer that we want to talk about from this time is a man known as Ivan Batuta. And he lived from 1304 to 1368. Uh, he was born in the city of Tangiers in North Morocco, as you can see there from the map. Um, this was part of the great Islamic empire, which stretched from Spain all the way across to Afghanistan. So while Marco Polo's journey was amazing, it really paled in comparison to Batuta. Batuta travelled to over 40 countries in 30 year period. So like that's 40 countries without any motorized vehicles at all. He traveled all along North Africa, leaving from Tangiers. Um, he would have seen cities such as Tunis and Alexandria and Cairo. Then he would have traveled to Arabia where he went to cities such as Medina and he made the Hajj to Mecca, which is a holy uh, pilgrimage that Muslims uh, are to partake uh, in their lifetime. Uh, he went to Afghanistan. He went down to the eastern coast of Africa, to the cities of Magadisha and Mombasa. He went to India. He went to Southeast Asia. Uh, he went to China. Uh, then as he came back across, he went to Constantinople. Um, and went up to Russia, into Spain, and then when he arrived back in North Africa, he crossed the Sahara Desert and went down to the Empire of Mali, which was under the rule of Mansa Musa, uh, and he saw the magnificent cities of Timbuktu and Gera. Uh, so it's an amazing journey that this man went on. Um, and along on his journey, he would have seen and he would have used many technological advancements that were foreign to Europeans at the time. Instruments such as this, as you can see here, the astrolabe, are, and quadrants. Um, and these instruments, uh, they would have been used to measure the latitudes. That, that's how many degrees north or south you are of the equator, which is crucial uh, to making sailing more exact. So how the quadrant work, uh, a sailor would see the north star along one edge, as you can see here, uh, and where the string fell uh, would tell approximately the ship's latitude. Uh, with the uh, astrolabe, um, he would have lined it up so that the sun shone through this uh, hole here, and when it matched up with the hole here, um, it would show you uh, your latitude. Um, in his travels along the east coast of Africa as well, he would have encountered ships with rudders. So rudders were um, devices at the back of a ship, um, which gave more control over the steering. So it, it allowed them to sail in shallow waters with more uh, kind of maneuverability. And these rudders coupled with the lead and line uh, or the swinging the lead technique stopped ships from running aground. 
the leaden line was measured, uh, so this measured the depth of shallow water. So a little, you can see at the end there, there's a bit of lead tied onto a rope that would have been dropped in the water. Um, there was pieces of material tied onto the rope, uh, which would indicate to the person who was swinging the lead how far down uh, or how deep the water was at the time. And he would call it out to the captain. Um, so Iban Batuta was told to come back to his home of Tangiers by the, the ruler of Tangiers in 1357 so that the stories of his travels and the wonders he saw uh, could be recorded. Um, the short title of the book is The Travels of Iban Batuta. Um, and while Batuta's journey wasn't translated into a European language at the time, it's kind of hard to believe that with the amount of trade that took place between the European countries and the Mediterranean and the Muslim Empire that his legendary journey wouldn't have influenced um, some of the future explorers. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, so our learning outcomes uh, that we stated at the beginning. One, you should know what the Great Silk Road is. So you, know, you should know that it is an overland trading network that had many routes. Uh, that went from China all the way to um, Asia Minor, modern day kind of Turkey. Uh, you should know two famous travelers at the time and at least one piece of information about them. So you should know Mark Poe, maybe you might know where he was born. You might know he spent three and a half years traveling the, the Great Silk Road, 16 years in the Chinese Emperor, the title of his book. Um, you could also talk about uh, Ibn Battuta, again born in Tangiers, when he was born, that he traveled to 40 countries uh, in a 30 year period. You can name some of the places like Timbuktu, uh, Constantinople, uh, Mecca, Goa, um, Mombasa. And then also you should know three technological advances brought from China and the Middle East to the European navigation and shipbuilding. Uh, so we talked about the compass, we talked about uh, the Latin sails, we talked about the quadrant and astrolabe, and we talked about the line and lead or the swing the lead technique. So that's our video for today. Uh, thanks for watching and I hope you got something from it.